Hi guys. Hey, hello there. How are you doing? Cool. Me too. So, you have graduated from level one. And now, this is where the fun begins. Some of you already did some of the level two workshop stuff, like the soundboard training, which we have a recording of, so you guys can watch that later if, if we don't do it again. Uh, in the mixing training is technically a level two thing. I, I don't know if we're going to do that again for everybody. That might just be uh, for you guys. Um, yeah, but this is where it gets fun. You know, the, the level one stuff is always really important to master the fundamentals before you move on. Um, but it can get kind of tedious doing it again and again and again. You know, it's kind of, kind of like learning an instrument where, you know, the, at the beginning, it's a lot of technique and posturing and you know, finger exercises and all that. And you have like the songs that you really want to play, but you have to go through all that fundamentals. And then you get past the basic stuff, and then like the whole world opens up and you're able to start playing the music that you really want to play. So that's kind of where we're at now. We've gone through all the basic stuff in level one, and now the fun begins. So we're going to do a three-part course uh, on system design. And uh, I apologize, I did not have time to finish making the slides or making them look good. I'm just going to click that. Maybe they look better now. Sure. So this is an incomplete slideshow. You're going to see some parts where it says insert picture here, and there's no picture inserted. So we're going to kind of make this up as we go. I was also going to bring a whiteboard so I can draw stuff, but it's in my car in Phillips Point, so that would be a long walk back. But anyway, system design. So the, this, this first one is going to be on speakers, amps, and microphones. The second one will be on gain staging and positioning, you know, how to place your speakers and your microphones and everything. Uh, the third one is going to be on system tuning. And let's just talk about what system design is. Uh, in audio. So this is my definition, because I couldn't find a definition out there, but system design is the strategic selection, placement, and optimization of equipment for a sound system. It, it could be for a permanent installation in a venue, could be a system to use on a tour, or something for like a one-time event. Uh, and the system designer, he's going to go visit the venue, do a site visit, take a look at the acoustics, look at where the audience is seated and find out what the, the needs are for the event. Is it a corporate event? Is it a concert? Is it a rock concert? A symphony concert? You know, all, all that um, goes into you know, the selection and, and placement of everything. So and he's going to use this knowledge of audio systems, how they work, and all the different products that are out there and select something, select, select speakers and amps and microphones and system processors that will be the best for that system, for that event, or that tour, or that venue. And the system designer usually has some, some role in um, optimizing it, like setting the games, doing all that game staging, uh, tuning the system, programming the processor, which is part of system tuning, uh, setting delays, and all of that. Uh, for our purposes, where this is really going to be helpful is um, for portable events, like when we're doing outdoor events. So this is going to enable you to think more independently about what speakers we're going to use and where to put, put everything. Uh, yeah. So we're going to start off talking about speakers. So the first thing you want to do when you're getting ready for an event and, you, and you're at the site and you're looking at it and you're looking at where the audience is going to be seated is you want to decide on a target sound pressure level, SPL. Sound pressure level, that's basically referring to loudness and actual loudness, not just loudness on a meter, but the actual volume that you're hearing in, in whatever space you're in. Uh, it's logarithmic. So the, the math can get kind of funny in how it's measured. It's measured in decibels. Um, six decibels is actually a doubling of SPL. So if something is 20 decibels, 
and then you, you bump that up to 26 decibels, now you've doubled the, uh, the actual volume of it. But psychologically, 10 decibels is where it starts to appear to double in volume. So kind of like, like with the weather, you know, this is the actual temperature and this is what it feels like. Um, I actually don't know the science behind why apparent loudness is different. Maybe nobody knows the loudness. Maybe it's just psychological studies like asking, hey, how does this sound compared to this? And doing that with a bunch of people and then coming up with this number. But for whatever the reason, that's how it works. Six decibels is an actual doubling. Ten decibels is an apparent doubling of volume. Uh, and I have some examples here of everyday life, um, just so you're not just looking at numbers, but you have, uh, was that a question? You can ask questions. Yeah? So because it's a logarithmic log function, but does that mean that like, it's kind of on a curve? Of it's like an exponent inverted. The way I, I like to think of it is like palm trees blowing in a hurricane, which okay. is a very Florida way to look at it. So. It like goes like that. So it's it's always going up, but the more the more it goes up, the the smaller the rate of increase is. So it there's like uh, in no there's not an asymptote. I think it actually continues going up. It just no there probably is an asymptote. Yeah, there is. But that's a difference of 50 decibels. A 50 decibel difference from normal breathing is a normal conversation. So you would th you would think that you know that it would go way up at the very beginning, but then kind of curve out at about I don't know 60 to 70 decibels, uh, and then it starts you know just kind of flat. You know you know. Yeah, so there, there is a limit to how loud things can get, and I think it has to do with just the composition of the atmosphere, the, the, the pressure in the air. I don't know offhand what that limit is. I do know that theoretically, if you're at about 1,000 and I want to say 35 decibels, you create a black hole bigger than the universe. So. When God was creating you, he said, I'm going to put a hard limiter on this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That is, by the way, about 10 times the power of a, of a Bose kit. So if, if, you, if you took the, the max volume of a Bose kit and multiplied that by 10 times, you would get a black hole bigger than the universe. Because it's logarithmic. So it's harder and harder to get to that point as you go higher up. But there, there are limits to how loud you can get here on Earth. So I, I don't think you can actually get there. I feel like the cap is like around 300 decibels or something like that. There's, there's an article I read about the Krakatoa volcano a while ago that broke it down. And Vsauce has a video on it, too. But I love Vsauce. I love Vsauce, too. But anyway, so here's, here's some examples for your reference. Zero decibels is the threshold of what is possible to hear. 10 decibels, normal breathing. 20 decibels, a mosquito buzzing. 30, a soft whisper. Actually, softer than that. Uh, 40 decibels, quiet office or library. Refrigerator, 50 decibels. 60 decibels, normal conversation. 70 decibels, freeway traffic, so a little bit louder than what we're hearing out there. Uh, 80 decibels, lawnmower, 90 decibels, a motorcycle 25 feet away. 100 decibels, jackhammer, 110, shouting in the ear. 120, ambulance siren, 130, stock car race. So just some references to understand that a little better. According to the CDC, Noise above 70 decibels over a prolonged period of time may start to damage your hearing. Going back to our chart here, so that would be freeway traffic. Um, they don't say how long that takes. Uh, but OSHA, for I don't know how they came up with these numbers exactly, but they're saying you can, you can do like 90 decibels for eight hours, and that's OK. So I would guess 70 decibels is a lot longer than that. Um, how long you can ex be exposed to it for. Uh, but eventually it does cause some damage. Yes, Alice? 
depends on the concert. We're going to get to some, we're going to get to some uh, recommended levels in a second, and you'll see that. But loud noise above 120 can cause immediate harm to your ears. So like 115 decibels, you can take that for like 15 minutes. 120, you're basically, you're, you're getting damaged that entire time. And damage is uh, irreparable right now with the current medical technology. You can repair your eyes with like laser surgery, but there's nothing for the ears. So take care, take care of your ears. Yes, Jordan. I remember going to a movie theater. And I Me too. Oh, I did that so once. Cool. Yeah. It was um, it's five years ago. Go ahead. That's a movie. Yeah. They showed that in the theater. They Now, I've read somewhere that the research here is based on the workplace and the research on the effects of music is actually incomplete. So we don't really know uh, how the effects of music, where music is a lot more dynamic than workplace machinery. We don't really know exactly what the effect is. It could be better, it could be worse, it could be the same. So we just go off of OSHA until, until some more research is done. There's a DBA and DBC. These are different ways of measuring, different curves. DBC is more of a flat measurement. DBA tries to uh, emulate the uh, sound, the, the uh, curve of human hearing, where we don't hear all frequencies equally. Um, so there's like a, a roll off on the low end. So DBA won't give you uh, as accurate a measurement of low end frequencies. But DBA is the standard that's used for these OSHA measurements. So even though you're not getting as accurate a measurement of the low end, DBA is what you would want to use if you're trying to be on the same page as the studies that OSHA did for the workplace. Insert picture of SPL meter, digital and analog. Whoa. Here, take a look. I'll put it on the screen. This is why I have my screen mirrored. SPL meter. How loud am I? 70 dB. Yeah, you're getting there. 70 dB. More like 65. Ah, it's moving around. I want it to be bigger. There you go. So there is an example of a SPL meter. They, they have settings typically to select DBA or DBC. You can take a slow measurement, which just kind of averages out what the sound level is at, or you can take a fast measurement, typically, which is more like an instantaneous peak. You can hear that back, or, or Alice wants to see it. You can take a look at it. <laughs> you could do that. There's also a max hold button, so sometimes I'll press that and I'll pass it in front of a speaker and I'll just kind of hold it there and then I'll look and I'll see what the loudest thing was because it, it, that's what that does. The max hold takes the loudest peak and just keeps the reading there for you. Yeah, so there's different settings. Lights up too. Pretty cool. Um, it has different ranges. There's a high and a low. So if I press low, now it's measuring from 300 to 100 decibels. If I need to measure something louder, I can press that again and put it on the high. And then it's going to measure from 60 to 130. So just be mindful of the settings. Make sure you're measuring on A and DBA and not C. Um, slow might be more comprehensible because if you put it on fast, it's just going to be changing so much on you. But if you put it on slow, then it just gives you a nice slower averaging of what you're hearing. So that's, that's a helpful tool. Um, DBA is a curve that approximates the human ear. 
where the low end gets rolled off. So here's what I recommend for um, events, the, the levels that we should be hitting. For spoken word, like someone preaching in chapel, I'd recommend around 60 to 80 dBA. And you can measure that here. Back to our handy reference chart here, 60 is like normal conversation, 80 is like a lawnmower, so somewhere between, yes, Grant, somewhere between those. SPL meter, decibel meter, um, loudness meter. How, like, like, what is the form of what it's captured through, through, like, um, is my point Like, how, is it pretty, like, omni? It's omni. Directional? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's omni. Yeah, it's Omni. Okay. But just because Omni doesn't mean it doesn't matter where you point it or where you hold it. So I, I'd want to hold it about where people, people's ears are going to be. And then we'll capture Omni directionally from there. Yeah. And just because it's Omni doesn't mean that it's going to capture down here because the body of it is blocking from, sound, from down there. But wherever there's no blockage, Omni is going to capture pretty equally from all directions. So yeah, uh, for live music here, I would recommend going somewhere around 80 to 100 decibels. So 80 would be like a lawnmower, 100 would be like a jackhammer. Uh, there's a couple reasons why I recommend this. Uh, one is personal preference. Uh, two is I want to protect your guys' ears. I have uh, high fidelity ear protection, costs about $30. So I'm good, but you guys might not have this, and we're not currently providing this. So I do want to protect your guys' ears. Your ears are one of your best tools. Yeah. So I also care about you guys, but, yeah, yeah. but also your ears are like one of your best tools. That's why I'm very careful to protect mine, because if I lose my hearing, I can't mix. So yeah, I, oh, there we go, I just squeeze it. So I have these high fidelity hearing protection earplugs from Soundcheck Audiology, the camera there. They, what's that? You can't see that? I was holding it up for the camera. They can't see it either. But yeah, these are, these are pretty handy. I think these knock it down like by 20 decibels, and it, it, it knocks every frequency down equally. So it's actually really cool. I, you'll forget that you're wearing them because everything sounds normal, just softer. It's like I, I, I used them when I was mowing the lawn to test them out, and at first, I mean, I noticed that everything was softer, but after a while, I forgot I was wearing them. They're very comfy, and uh, everything just sounded normal. It didn't sound like I was wearing earplugs. But then when I took them out, all of a sudden, the world got a lot louder. Yeah. So these are pretty handy. Alice. So if you were to, like, say you were going to a concert, right? Would you those? Depends. Well, the idea is that you still get the experience because it, it sounds normal, but softer. Otherwise, I would just wear normal earplugs, and then that would ruin the experience because some of the frequencies will be lost. I got these mainly because I'm a drummer, so I want to be able to hear the music normally but protect my hearing at the same time. And drums are very loud. Yes. A snare drum, if you hit it in just the right way, hit it hard enough, you can hit like 120 on a snare. Just the snare. So yeah, there's that. And then also, there's limits to how loud our speakers can go. And we'll, we'll get to that soon. So yeah, 80 to 100 is what I would recommend here. There was one event on campus that was pushing to 130 with our equipment, which is about the limit of the speakers of what they were using. Wait, does that scare you? No, no, that, that did not get that loud. It was. Maybe we should take it out of the recording, but no, no, you're good. But it, it, was, a, it was a house concert inside of uh, someone's apartment on campus. Oh. Were you there? You know what I'm talking about? It's, it's 130. People definitely damage their ears permanently for the rest of their lives. They're instantly, the whole time. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and they also, 
could have potentially blown out our, blown yes. out our speakers because the, they were really pushing close to the, to the limit of what the speakers can do. So, yeah. So yeah, if you're on an event and you're going to be pushing out loud volume, please use a meter and make sure that we're not uh, hurting people or hurting uh, our equipment. Outside of PBA, it's a wild wor world out there. <laughs> Pretty typical concert. You said Lady Gaga. They're, they're not all like, so the, the typical figure you, you, you hear quoted in talks like this is 120 is typical for a rock concert. It's not exactly true anymore because there's been a lot more awareness and enforcement in, in, in some places uh, to protect people's ears. So a lot of concerts are actually going to be closer to like 100 to 110. Um, but there's also definitely concerts that are pushing louder to 120 or even 130. And apparently the one on our campus was pushing that loud. I'm not, I'm not particularly happy about that, by the way. But <laughs> no. no. I found out from someone's Instagram story who had a meter. And they showed the what? reading. Yeah. Well, I thought people were just carrying around a meter just randomly. It was the guy running the oh, uh, uh, running okay. sound for it. So you're you're designing a system for an event. You decide how loud you want it to be. If it's spoken word, probably around sixty to eighty. If it's live music, we're aiming for around eighty to a hundred. Now what do we do with that information? Well, now we get to speakers. We need to measure the throw distance. You have a question. No, not really. It could change other considerations like speakers, which speakers you use, but it wouldn't change the target SPL. Uh, so you want to measure the throw distance. Uh, typically, you would do this with a range finder, like one that you hold up to your ear. I mean, your eye, not your ear, <laughs> range finder. And you can kind of look at the bleachers or whatever and see how far away it is. Or you could use like a laser pointer range finder. Um, we don't have any of that here. So estimate, do your best. Just try to. Yeah, they, they do have some nice ones. So then we want to select a speaker that will allow us to achieve that SBL without blowing it out. And to do that, we need to de determine what the max SPL is of the speaker that we're considering. So here's how you do that. So we want to look up the spec sheet for a potential speaker. Let, let's say we're thinking about using this guy for our event. And let, let's say that we're shooting for 100 dB. So this is a JBL PRX 412M. So I'm going to Google the spec sheet for that. Yes, PRX 412M. Specifications. This might not be super complete, um, but there's there's two there's two specs here that you want to pay attention to: the system sensitivity and the power rating. And here they actually give you the maximum SPL, but sometimes they don't give you that. Sometimes they give you just the sensitivity and, and the power rating, and you can calculate the system sensitivity from that. I mean the the, the max SPL from that. So find the sensitivity spec, find the power handling spec, and then you calculate it with that. And I'll show you how to do that. So speaker sensitivity is the SPL measured at one meter away when one watt of power is applied to it. So if I have the speaker here and I'm applying one watt of power and I'm standing like one meter away, sensitivity is that. So if it's uh, say 90 dB at one meter, that's what that means. You apply one watt of power, you stand one meter away, you're going to get 90 decibels at that distance. And typically it's measured with a one kilohertz tone. So they played a, in the laboratory when they were designing the speaker, they played a, a one kilohertz tone uh, with a power of one watt and they got that figure. Uh, here I actually just noticed they did it with pink noise, or at least they did that for the, for the 
power rating, but that, that would also be what they did for uh, the other measurements. So they used pink noise instead of a one kilohertz tone. Um, so that's cool they, they specify that. Uh, yeah, so that's what sensitivity is. Now doubling the wattage does not double the sound pressure. What it does is it increases it by 3 dB. So if uh, 90 decibels at one, no, if one watt gives me 90 decibels one meter away, then two watts doubling it would give me 93 decibels. Right, it goes up by three, and then four watts would give me 96 decibels. So it keeps going up by three decibels when every time you double the wattage. So I have an example here. Let's say that it's a 200 watt speaker with a sensitivity of 90 dB at one meter. If I multiply that by two, eight times, double it eight times, I'm going to get 256 watts. A little bit over 200 watts, but just a rough figure. So then if I take that three decibel increase and I multiply that by eight, then I, I see that uh, it's a 24 decibel increase. So if I, if I double the wattage eight times, I'm going to get a 24 decibel increase. Um, and that gives me an SPL of 114 decibels. So for a 200 watt speaker with a sensitivity of 90 dB, the max SPL is going to be a little bit under 114 decibels. Does that math make sense, how I explain that? Do, do I need to explain it again? Um, I guess, like, how can you do the limit of how many times you can double the wattage to, to determine, like, what the max is? So I, I'm, just, I'm just taking one watt and I'm doubling it until I get to that wattage. So I take one watt, I double it, I double it again, I double it again, and keep doubling it until I get to the, the wattage on the rating. Even if it goes over until you get to the wattage on one? It's a 200 watt speaker. 200 watt speaker. If you double one watt seven times, it'll be under the 200 watt limit. So then you double it again, and then you get the 256, and then you stop. You stop when you go over. Yeah. Okay. So so the 200 watt speaker means like that that is the rating. So, okay. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, Alice, what what I just explained is when you uh, sensitivity on a speaker is when you measure from one meter away from the speaker and you're applying one watt. That's the decibels you get, ninety decibels or whatever the sensitivity rating is. So in this case, it's ninety decibels at one meter. And then when you, when you double the wattage, the, the decibels does not double. The decibels goes up by three decibels. So if it's a sensitivity of 90 decibels at one meter, one watt, if I do two watts, then it's 93 decibels. And then what you use, the way you use that to calculate the max SPL is you take the power rating, let's pretend it's 200 watts, if I, if I double one watt eight times, then that gets me to about 200 watts. So I'm, I'm close to the, to the max of the power weight rating there. And then if I double three decibels by that same amount, then I get uh, how much of a decibel increase that is. It's 24 decibels. So for a 200 watt speaker with a sensitivity of 90 dB at one meter, the max SPL is going to be 114 dB. Make sense? Uh, I mean, if you're applying less than a watt, is that even theoretically, okay. but not practically, not practically, because okay. you're not even going to know on a power amp how much wattage you're doing unless you have equipment to measure that. In the laboratory, then they have equipment to measure that. Gotcha. But yeah, so yeah, I, I don't know when I'm turning the volume knobs exactly how much wattage I'm doing. Although I could do this math, measure it first and do some algebra and figure out how much wattage I'm applying. Now, if, uh, if you're good with math, if you know what natural logs are, or even if you don't, if you just have a scientific calculator and you see the LN button, 
Um, this is a faster way and a more accurate way to measure it. You can take the natural log of the wattage, divide by the natural log of two, and that will give you exactly how many times you have to double the one watt to get to the max. So for example, if we did natural log 200, because it's a 200 watt speaker, and we divide that by natural log of two, we get 7.6, right? Not, not eight, eight was like our estimate, just doing arithmetic there. But if we do some algebra, we, we get the exact number, which is 7.6. And so then I can, I can do the math here, and what I get is the actual max SPL is 112.8 decibels. I do. I do. This is part of how I select what speakers we're using, especially for outdoor events. I look at the specs because I don't have all the specs memorized. I'll do the math. If, if they don't have, this one has the maximum SPL there, but they don't always give you that. So sometimes I have to do the math. And, and I, I decide on a target SPL. I, I walk out there, I look at the site, hopefully I get a diagram, and I figure out what the best speaker is for us to use. We're a bit limited here because we don't have a huge warehouse with so many different speakers to choose from. But we do have a few different speakers. You know, we, we've got this guy, we've got the PV wedges, we've got our line arrays, we've got our, our Mackey speakers, we've got those uh, uh, IGT3 DB Tech column speakers, we've got Bose kit, we've got the Fender portable system. So we do have different options that, that we can go with. Um, No, but that's an interesting consideration because uh, it, it does compound. But it compounds logarithmically. So if the room were uh, 100 decibels loud, which would be a very loud room, and then we pump 100 decibels in there, it's going to compound to 106 decibels, I believe. But you know, most rooms are not going to be that loud. So. So that, that is an interesting consideration. But no, I, I, don't, I don't actually do that. I'm, I'm sure there is. I'm, I'm sure there is. So you, you could Google that and find that. But there's also something called the inverse square law. For every doubling of distance, you lose six decibels. So if your speaker is outputting 100 dB, at one meter away, but the back row is 20 meters away, well, you do this math, you're going to lose 25 decibels. And so even though it's so loud up front for the people sitting here, 100 decibels, the back row is only going to hear like 70 decibels. That's the inverse square law. So back to our reference sheet here. So you go from a jackhammer down to freeway traffic. And if they're farther away, then you might even lose more. Now, is that um, what they determine in kind of like just a totally open space? Because wouldn't, um, like, depending on how high you set your speakers, depending on like what might be in the background, like, would that change certain things? Yeah, we're, we're going to get to all that. Okay. that. That's part of part of what we're going over. Uh, a line array, because of some of the physics, which we'll also get to it actually minimizes the inverse square law a little bit. Instead of losing six decibels, you only lose three decibels, but you're still losing quite a bit. A line array being? A line array, I'll show you a picture. Oh, it's like the, they use those a lot in concerts. Uh, here you go. There's a line array. Okay, okay. Yeah. So how, how does it? We'll get to that. We're going to get to the physics a bit later. We do have line arrays here, yeah. Yeah, we do. Yeah. We don't have enough to make an array that big, but we do have four line arrays. And the Bose kit is actually using line array technology inside of this thing. And we'll, maybe we'll get to that, too. Does the math make sense? Inverse square law, calculating the max SPL. So. 
Now we'll move on to power amps. So you have a speaker. Some of our speakers are active like this, and so the manufacturer either bought a power amp or created their own power amp that was specifically made for the speaker. So that's one of the advantages of active speakers. The power amp is already inside and it's already matched. But with a passive speaker like this, you have to match a power amp to it. So how do you do that? Well, there's a couple of different considerations. You have to consider the power handling and you also have to consider the impedance. So some of you, you've heard me talk about impedance during the level one training and you've been like, what is impedance? And I've explained a little bit and I told you we'll get to that later. Here we go, we're gonna get to that. Um, but first we're gonna talk about power handling. So going back to our speaker here, our speaker specs. Uh, let's see, JBL PRX412M. The power handling, you'll notice, just to simplify it, I just said 200 dB, I mean 200 watts. But typically, or hopefully, it's actually gonna give you three different numbers, continuous, program, and peak. So when they're doing their testing and they're using pink noise, 300 watts is kind of a good, healthy uh, level that the, the speaker, we're talking about speaker still, that the speaker can handle over a long period of time and there won't be any damage. So kind of like our ears, 70 decibels is where you could potentially get damage if you listen to it for a very long time uninterrupted. 60 decibels, I guess you would be okay forever. Um, kind of like that, 300 watts is the continuous power rating. You could play 300 watts through this thing night and day and it'll wear out eventually, but it's not gonna get damaged just from that wattage. 600 watts is kind of like your, some of your headroom because the, the content that you're playing through the speaker could exceed that. You know, it's, it's gonna go up and down. It's not gonna stay steady at 300 watts. So typically the program is double continuous. In fact, sometimes that, that's how they calculate it. They just double the continuous and you can see there it is doubled. 300 watts is continuous, 600 watts is program. But program just kind of accounts for, for some of the, the peaks and valleys in the content that you're playing. Um, they might just calculate that through uh, math or they might actually play program material like music to test it and figure that out. Um, but this kind of is your range. That's, that's the nice healthy room to, to play with between 300 watts and 600 watts. And then the peak, this would be the absolute most that it could handle. So if it, if it hits 1201 watts, you might be blowing out your speaker. So we, we don't want to hit 1200 if we can help it. And ideally we want to stay around 300 to 600 watts with this speaker. We're looking at the specs for this one. So now how do we match a power amp? Well, let's take a look at this one. This is QSC 1400 something, RMX 1450, QSC RMX 1450 specs. Specifications. Okay, here we go, the watts, well, hold on. I just want a simple power rating to show you. Got the stereo mode, 1450, bridge mono. Okay, this is, this is kind of a complicated spec sheet, which is helpful, but I, I just wanna give you a simple figure. Let's just pretend we're looking at that and we're seeing something like this on the amp. 600 watt, continuous, 800 program, peak, 1,000. So you're, you're gonna look at the spec sheet for this and see what that spec is, and then look at the spec sheet for your amp that you're thinking about and look at the specs there. And here's the things we're trying to avoid. We don't want a severely underpowered amp. So if the speaker is 300 watts and the amp is rated for like 100 continuous, that's pretty underpowered. We don't want that. We want something that's gonna be within that optimal range of the speaker. We also don't wanna drive the speaker past its peak rating. So if this, the peak rating is 1200 watts, we don't wanna push beyond that. We don't even wanna hit that to be safe. But the other thing we wanna avoid is we don't want to drive the amp 
into clipping, because that can actually be even worse for the speaker. Because if the amp starts clipping, it's going to send some really sharp transients to this guy, and that driver is going to have some harsh movements. Uh, and it could do something called over excursion, where it kind of it moves too far beyond what's designed for, and it, it gets stuck. And you need a new driver at that point, basically. It's, it's, it's gone. Or the voice coil could burn out if you're throwing too much at it. Um, so there's different ways you could damage the speaker. And that could come just by clipping the amp. Even if you're not driving the wattage beyond its rating, if the amp is clipping, that could damage the speaker. So the ideal, what's that? I didn't know if it's clipping. You'll hear it. It's going to distort. It'll sound very distorted. And uh, you'll, you'll hear the speaker struggling, too. It'll sound like it's throttling. It, it, it'll sound like it's having a hard time. Um, yeah. So the ideal, believe it or not, is actually a slightly overpowered amp. So you, ideally, you want an amp that can actually go a little bit beyond 1,200 watts. And, and here's why. So if you, if you decided on your target SBL and you chose a speaker that can get you well within that, you're never going to drive the amp past that because that's the level you decided on and, and the speaker can get there. So you don't need to worry about uh, blowing out the speaker as long as the amp isn't incredibly more powerful than it. Uh, if it's slightly more, if, if the amp is slightly overpowered, the amp will never clip and you're never going to drive it, you know, you're never going to drive the speaker louder than it needs to go anyway because, because you already decided how loud you wanted it to be. Does that make sense? So slightly overpowered amp is what you want to go with. Yes, Alice? So is the information of the continuous the program feed for the amps and speakers, is that going to be presented in the same format? It should be. Some of it is broken out more complicated. That's why I, I didn't look at this because I, I want to keep this simple. Um, this gets into impedance and how the different settings changes the, the power. But, but yeah, typically you're going to see a figure like this on the spec sheet for the amp and the spec sheet for the speaker. And you just look at those specs side by side and pick an amp that's slightly overpowered. That makes sense? Now we'll talk about impedance. So are, are you guys fuzzy on what impedance is? I, I figured. Uh, impedance is very complicated. Uh, to really understand it solidly, you have to explore a whole different field from what we're doing. You have to get into uh, electrical work, you know, study circuits, circuit boards, and stuff like that, capacitors, resistors. Um, so totally different field. We'd have to study that from the ground up to really get a complete understanding of what impedance is. But just for our purposes, it is electrical resistance in an AC circuit. So when you're dealing with direct current, like if I have a battery in this, and internally, internally there's some wires going from one side of the battery through the electronics and then back to the other side of the battery. So it's just a nice direct loop going through this battery. Um, in a DC circuit like that, we talk about resistance. You know, the, Every wire is going to resist electrical flow to some extent. Some wires will resist it more, some will resist it less. If there's more resistance than you need, then you need more, more voltage or more current to push through that. If there's less resistance, then you don't need as much to push through it. Make sense? But when we're dealing with AC circuits, which is what's coming out of your outlets, and that's what a dynamic microphone is generating, you know, an AC circuit, the polarity is constantly flipping. So it, the current moves one way and it moves back the other way, and it just keeps moving back and forth. Yeah? So it's like uh, when electrons are lost and get like AB because the, the medium is not. You know, I actually don't know. I think, I think what it does is it just takes away energy from the movement of the electrons. Right. But so there might be some energy. loss of it too. Yeah. I'm sure you could. It probably knows this stuff better than me. But anyway, when we're talking about an AC circuit, which is mainly what we're dealing with in audio, phantom power is direct current, but almost everything else is AC. Uh, then we're talking about impedance. 
Impedance is resistance, but in an AC circuit. It is measured in ohms. Uh, one of the things that makes it different from direct current is that impedance actually changes depending on the frequency of the signal. So the, the, the impedance rating you see on a spec sheet is just a nominal rating. If it says 8 ohms, that is just a nominal rating. Sometimes it will be, be higher than 8 ohms. Sometimes it will be less than 8 ohms depending on the frequencies that are passing through the signal. So it, ac it actually changes on you. Uh, impedance does not change power. So you know, we were talking about wattage. What is wattage exactly? It is voltage times amps. Impedance does not change that. If the impedance changes, the wattage is still going to be the same. Impedance is like a different packaging of the same power. So the, there's different ways to calculate the same power. If I have a certain voltage and I have a certain amperage that equals a certain power, I can, I can increase my volts and I can decrease my current and I still get the same power. Or vice versa, I can put my current up and I can put my voltage down and I still have the same power. The equation balances out. Does that make sense? Should I explain that again? We're good? Okay. So different impedances, the power is the same, but you're, you're putting your voltage up and your current down or your current up and your voltage down. A higher impedance is raising the voltage and lowering the current, but the power is still the same. A lower impedance is lowering the voltage and increasing the current, but the power is still the same. Uh, it is it's a complicated conversation. You actually want higher impedance for like headphones and stuff like that. Um, maybe we will circle around back to that. It, it, it depends. So in AMP, if you look at the spec sheet, it will likely be rated to handle a range of ohms. Uh, examples, this is a pretty typical range. 4 ohms, 8 ohms, 16 ohms are pretty typical numbers. The speaker is just going to have one, one rating like 8 ohms is pretty typical for a speaker. But an amp will typically have a range that it can handle, you know, 4, 8, 16, some kind of a range. The rule is that the impedance of the speaker should not be below the range of what the amp is rated to handle. Because remember, higher impedance means higher voltage, lower impedance means higher current. Well, just pay attention to this one. Lower impedance means higher current. So if the speaker has a lower impedance than the range that the amp can handle, that means the speaker is going to be pulling more current out of the amp than what the amp is designed to handle, which could damage the amp. It could damage the speaker. So the, the speaker should not be below whatever the, the amp is rated for. And then uh, if it is the other way around, if the speaker is higher impedance than what the amp can handle, uh, I think there could be some damage, but the, but the bigger issue, well, I guess that is a pretty big issue, but the other issue is you are you're, you're going to be under powering, under driving that speaker. So yeah, look at the range of the spec sheet on the amp, look at the, the, the impedance rating on the speaker on the speaker make sure it's within that range and especially not lower than what that range is but then you could talk about that screen. Oh, thank you uh, I, I personally need a year or two so so um no i'm going to you were impeded you were impeded That's a good question. I don't know the answer. I haven't done this with a, a wide enough range of products well, to tell ours you. Work. Ours work. Yeah. This is underpowered for like our big JBL subwoofers. Uh, I think it's fine for this guy. I think I've done that calculation before. Uh, yeah. So ideally, the amp and the speaker will have the same nominal impedance, and the amp will be slightly overpowered for the speaker. 
A couple things to note, if you daisy chain two speakers in parallel from the same output on your amp, so we've got an output there, if we run the speaker off of that output and then we daisy chain another one onto it, the impedance of the individual speakers is actually going to change. So if you, if you take, let's, let's say they're, that each one is an 8 ohm speaker and then we daisy chain them like that. Now they're each four ohms. You, you take the number, you take the, the impedance and you divide it by the number of speakers. So if it's, if it's two eight ohm speakers divide by two, you get four ohms. So that's another thing to keep in mind as you're wiring things. Maybe you check the spec sheets and the rating look fine, but then you daisy chain them and now maybe you're outside of the specs. But if, if you do keep that in mind, can you daisy chain Yeah, absolutely, as long as it stays within spec. You're good. Um, yeah, or, or, or pulling a certain amount from, from the amp. When they're wired in series, there's no change in impedance. Each one is still eight. How do you know if it's in series or in parallel? Well, it depends how the speaker is internally wired, but pretty much all of them are, are internally wired in parallel, so I would just assume that it's parallel. If you really wanted to be sure, you could, you could look at the specs. And you can see here it says parallel Neutrik speak on in quarter inch combo jacks. So I, I know that the, the speaker, these connectors are parallel. Or sometimes it'll give you a wiring schematic and you can just follow the, li the lines and, and see that they're parallel or in series. But when in doubt, it's probably parallel. That's pretty standard. Yeah. Uh, then there's settings. There's dip switches on the back of your power amp right here. They're dip switches because they're recessed, so you have to stick something in there to switch them. Some examples of some of the settings you might find. You might find a variable impedance control. So that range that it gives you on the spec sheet, 4, 8, 16, there might be a switch in here so you can, or a dial so you can, you can change what the impedance is. Some microphones have that. Some speakers have that. The amp might have that. There's also these different settings for how, how the channels work. You know, this, this is a two-channel amp, a stereo amp. If you set it to stereo, it will function as a stereo amp. You know, it'll take a different signal to, into each channel and then output a different signal onto each output. So you, you could run it in stereo. Or you could run it uh, parallel. I'm trying to remember what that is. Bridge, I know what bridge mono is. Bridge mono is you, you, put, you put one signal into one connector and it, it spits it out on both of them. Yeah, it's, it's mono. Um, and then I think only one control actually controls the thing. So you can't use both of them. Just you know, whichever, whichever channel you plugged into, the, the knob for that one controls the volume of, of both of them in bridge mono. Let's look it up. Yeah. We've got Google here. Difference between parallel and bridge mono. Parallel operation routes an identical audio signal of one amp input into both channels. So that's what I meant. That's, I, I said that was bridge mono, that's actually parallel. Um, bridge mono combines two amp channels into, okay, gotcha. So, so you can put two different signals in here, one channel on the other channel, and then the bridge mono combines that into mono, whereas parallel is what I was saying earlier, that you, you put it into one channel and it, it spits it out on, on both. So yeah, it's good to know how that works. Also be aware, the spec sheet will, will tell you how it all works those settings will affect the impedance and the power handling. Um, and that's what we're looking at here in this complicated spec sheet where it tells you in stereo, in stereo mode um, you're going to get you know, that, those ohms. Again, it varies per frequency. So at 20 hertz, you're gonna, it, it's going to take that ohms. At 1 kilohertz, it'll take that. Um, so you can see it broken down by frequency. In bridge mono, it does this. And you can see the wattage is changing depending on if you're stereo or bridge mono. And I guess this doesn't have a parallel mode. 
Um, so yeah, it changes. <laughs> Fun. That's how impedance works. Uh, there's typically a high pass filter on here, like maybe 30 hertz or something like that. And that's a protection for the speaker because sometimes there's some really low frequencies that might not even be generated by an instrument. It might just be noise on the cable or it might come from the instrument. And uh, those low frequencies, if they're not controlled, they can, they can damage your speaker. So it's good to have some kind of a really low high pass on your amp or your processor or wherever you can put in. The amp usually has that built in, so you can just switch that. Uh, I, I have that turned on in all of our amps. There's usually limiting protection, some kind of limiter um, that keeps the amp from ever clipping. So that, that's good to turn on. Um, doesn't completely solve your problem of you know, matching the amp to the speaker. I mean, it, it helps because it's never technically going to clip, but still, if you slam a limiter too hard, it can sort of have that effect still. And um, I was going to make another point. I can't remember what it is. But you still want to match the specs, but then just as, as an extra protection, you can turn on limiting on your dip switch if it, if it has that. Some amps also have uh, settings. So you, if you have like one amp for your subwoofer, another amp for your tops, or however you're splitting it up, some, some, of the, some amps will have settings. Um, to filter out certain frequencies, or you're only sending the lows to the sub, or you're only sending the highs to a different speaker. So you might see a setting that says, like, sub, full range, tops on the back there. So that, that's another thing to, to check. And directivity, some, some speakers, they call it directivity. What it really is is a high frequency boost. And it's because high frequencies are more directional. Um, so when you turn that, that directivity thing on, it can, it can affect how the speaker seems to be directing sound. Um, but really all it is, it's boosting the highs. So there's, there's different settings to look at. So if you're ever running a monitor, we mostly use these as monitors or any kind of passive speaker, and it's not doing what you want it to do, and you've checked everything on the soundboard and everything looks fine there, but you're not getting the sound that you're supposed to be getting, Check the switches on the back. They, they have the, them labeled here, what each thing does. Make sure all the settings are good. Maybe you have two different wedges on the same power amp, and you're trying to send a different mix to one than the other, but it's in bridge mono, so it's not going to work. Um, so yeah, check those settings. Um, now we're going to get into the, well, let me, let me just pause there, because this is a lot of information. Uh, any questions on anything we've gone over so far? Uh, sound pressure, speakers, ter determining max SBL, power handling, impedance. Any questions on any of that? Anything I should explain again? Yeah. Yeah, and this, this was originally, I didn't have a lot of time to prep for this. I was going to have pictures and all sorts of stuff to show you. I was going to have visual aids. But yeah, I, I, I can send you, there's some good videos I can send you guys. So now we're going to get to coverage. So just walk through some of these steps. We, we visited the venue. We got information on what the event is. We decided on a target SPL for that event. We chose a speaker that had a max SPL well above what our target was. We selected an amp that was slightly overpowered for the speaker and that was within the, the range of the, yeah, that uh, has a range of impedance that the speaker falls within. So we match the amp to the speaker. Uh, next, what all this is about really is coverage. That's like the most important thing about system design. There's other things like aesthetics, like we have, we have speakers that are painted white in the chapel, and that looks nice. That's also part of system design. But function before form. Got to make sure it works the way that it should work before we make it look pretty. 
coverage is the most important thing about system design. Just a couple quick things before we really get into this. Aim speakers at people, yeah. not walls or objects. You know, sometimes you'll, you'll look at a venue and you'll be like, ah, I'll aim a speaker roughly over there and I'll aim a speaker roughly over there, but you're not thinking about the people. The people are the ones that need to hear it. So think about where people are actually going to be and aim your speakers at them. It can be helpful to divide your venue into zones and give each, each zone a speaker. So maybe, maybe I can divide it neatly into two zones, this half and that half. And I don't want to put the speaker way over there and way over there, but I want to place it kind of in the middle of each zone so that zone is covered. How you divide it also kind of depends on if, you're, if you care about stereo, um, which is actually one of the big debates. There's lots of debates out there in the audio world, but for live sound, does it matter if you, if you build a stereo image since no one is going to be seated perfectly in between the speakers? Some, some sound guys really love stereo and they try to hold on to that. And then uh, others, I would say most would fall more in the category of saying stereo is nice, but it's just too complicated in a live environment. So, you know, maybe pan things a little bit, but you know, don't, don't, don't go too crazy with stereo. In which case, you know, you're not going to aim the speakers in so much to cross at a point to give you a stereo image, but you're just aiming them so that you're covering each zone with sound. So that, that's another consideration to how you, how you divide up your zones, how you aim your speakers. Uh, do you care about stereo? And should you? Uh, for myself, uh, when it comes to placing the speakers, I, I, I don't give a whole lot of um, attention to the stereo image, but depending on the context, I might pan a little bit because uh, it, it, it is nice when you can get that, but I, just, I don't go too crazy with it. Anyway. That, that's all kind of a side note. What if iPods are mono? They, they can be. Really? Yeah. But uh, yeah, so what we're looking to do is get even SPL coverage, usually. There might be some events where, you know, there's people that are up front listening to the music, and then there's people that are farther back, and they're at tables, and they're enjoying some conversation. And maybe you actually want uneven coverage. You actually want it louder for the people in the front and quieter for the people in the back. Maybe. But most of the time, you want it to be pretty even. You know, whatever that target SPL is, most of the time you want that to be the actual SPL all over the venue. That's ideal. And remember, because of the inverse square law, you have this guy pumped up to 100 dB. Well, the people who are 20 meters away are only, only going to get 70. So if, to get, if your target is 90, then you have to crank this up louder. and and now they're getting 90, but now the people in the front are getting really blasted. They're getting maybe 110, 120, who knows. So you can't just crank up the speakers to get it louder for the people in the back, because then you're going to be blasting the people in the front on even coverage. So how do you get even coverage? Uh, well, you may recall, I think we've done this before, but water is often a good analogy when talking about electricity. You know, Sound systems are often explained kind of like sprinkler systems where you have the water going through all these different pipes to get to different places. When you're, when you're speaking of, of sound outside of the wires, actual sound in the room, it's good to think of it as light. So you have like the water analogy for while the signal's inside the wires, and then you have the light analogy for when you're actually getting the sound out of the speakers. So it's, it's good to think of speakers as flashlights. If I have a flashlight, like on the table here, you can see it's brighter there and dimmer farther away. And it's not sending light everywhere, it's sending it along a certain beam, a certain area that's being covered. So one of the implications, Grant alluded to this earlier, is just like with a flashlight, if I raise it higher, I get more even coverage because now the flashlight is closer to being the same distance from each point. In the same way, if you raise a speaker higher, you're going to get more even coverage. That's so cool. No one's going to be sitting up here in the air. They're all down here, so they're, they're more, more of the same distance. It's too loud up here. <laughs> and there's something, I think it's called the range ratio, some, some kind of ratio. 
where it's like the ratio of uh, the people from the back to the people at the front. Um, I want to say like a good ratio is like two to one to four to one you know, in between there. So, you know, if, if you're raising your speakers up, you can measure the distance from here to the back row and then to there. And if, if the ratio is like between two to one to four to one, that's a pretty good ratio. Um, I don't really do that around here, but it's just a good thing to consider. You know, think about, you know, the, the difference between how loud it is here and how loud it is there. And you want it to be pretty close to the same. Um, and you can, you can accomplish that by getting them higher. Uh, this is why flown speakers, speakers that are hung from the ceiling or from a truss, those are typically preferred to ground stacked speakers because they're higher up. Uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense to fly them. We don't really have trusses around here. We don't really have the option to do that. So we end up having to ground stack them or put them on speaker stands. Uh, but still, do what you can to get them high. You know, if you're going to put them on a speaker stand, raise that speaker stand up. Raise it up high. Maybe aim the speaker down a little bit. Um, and that will help. Use sandbags to keep it stable. But yeah, higher is better to get nice, even coverage. Another thing to consider with the whole flashlight analogy, shadows. You know, if, uh, I mean, we know what shadows are, but, you know, if the light is shining here and I put an object there, it's going to cast a shadow. You know, it's going to block the light. Not completely. It might block the light completely, but, you know, there's still some light there. It's just, it's partially blocking the light. Same thing with, with speakers. If there's an object between you and the speaker, this, the object is going to cast a shadow. You know, it's going to block some of the sound or maybe all of the sound. Uh, typically, it'll block higher frequencies rather than lower frequencies. So if you're in a concert in your short, hey Alice, and you're standing behind lots of tall people, you might hear a lot of bass and not hear a lot of the top end. And maybe you'll, you'll lose some of the, the intelligibility of the vocals. Um, or if you're behind a, a wall or a tree or, or some kind of pillar or something, you know, it's, it's going to block some of the sound. And that's why it's not ideal uh, in chapel where the soundboard is behind a TV. Yeah. And it's also, there's other acoustical things going on where it's getting funneled through a little opening. But you got a TV right in front of you. <laughs> it's going to block some sound. It's not going to block like the low end. You know, it gets really boomy up there. If you've, ever, if you've ever, ever mixed in there, you get a lot of low end. And you don't really hear the high so much. So it, that's why that's not an ideal mixing position. This, by the way, is a good thing to consider when you're, when you're deciding where the soundboard is going to go, where the sound booth is going to go in your event. Yeah. So you, know, you want to think about the placement of the speakers. It's also good to think about the placement of your mixing position. Uh, so you can, you can hear you know, pretty well what, what's coming at you from the speaker, like in the middle of the zone, or if it's stereo, you know, where the, where the, the two converge. Um, and you don't want to be behind something that will cast a shadow on you. Uh, getting speakers higher will help eliminate shadows, uh, but sometimes you also need fills. Uh, fills are just other speakers besides your mains that you use to kind of fill in the areas where the mains are not covering. So for example, front fills. You know, if you're, you have, you've got a main over here and a main over here, the, the front row right in the middle might not be hearing much. So that's not so much a shadow, it's just there's, there's, no, there's no light there. So you could use front fills to help fill that in. Um, in this space, we have delay fills because we have that, that like lowered ceiling blocking a lot of the sound from the mains. And so we have other speakers there to cover that zone. So in here, you have like a zone here, a zone here, but you also have a zone in the front and a zone in the back, and we're using fills to cover that zone in the back. They're called delay fills because uh, you have to set a delay on them to get them to, to sync up with these speakers because they're, they're a different distance. They're, they're closer to the audience over there. So yeah, you can, use, you, can use, you can get your speakers high to help minimize the shadows, and then if there's still some shadows because of just how things are positioned and objects and structures, you can use fills to fill that in. It depends where they're located. The delay 
here is probably actually the mains. The mains are probably actually delayed. So, so if you have these speakers and those speakers, right? Yeah. These ones have a delay on them so that this. So that they match up with the sound coming out of the fills. So why do they call them delay fills? Well, just to kind of remind you, you need to set a delay somewhere, I guess. But it just depends on where they're positioned. That, that will determine where the delays are set. Make sense? Dispersion pattern. We're going to talk about microphones a bit later, but you already know microphones have a polar pattern or a pickup pattern. They don't, they don't always pick up evenly in all directions. Omnidirectional mics like this one will. Cardioid mic like this, you can see the cardioid symbol there. It's going to pick up more along the front side of the the mic, and it's going to reject a lot from the back. It'll pick up some from the side as well. Uh, speakers also have a pattern, not a pickup pattern, but a dispersion pattern or a coverage pattern, and that that's something you'll also find on the spec sheet. Typically, it looks like this. They'll give you the horizontal dispersion in the vertical dispersion in degrees. So this is a pretty typical dispersion pattern, 90 degrees horizontal, 60 degrees vertical. Uh, roughly the way I like to measure this on an event is I'll just stick my arms out. That's 180. If I do like a perfect square like that, that's, or maybe I guess like that, that's like 90. So I got 180, I got 90, and if it's, if it's a little more than 90, then I just roughly move my arms between there. So that, that'll just give you a rough idea and you can just kind of look and see where's the sound going to go based on, based on that. Or you could do geometry and, I don't know, get out a laser and measure things. We don't have time to do that around here. We're, we're not setting up for events like days before and, or dedicated just on that one event. We have so many events going on. So I use shortcuts. <laughs> I just use my arms. Uh, I don't always do all the math. But because I understand the, these dynamics and how these things work, I can get a rough idea sometimes, uh, just, just understanding it. Um, so let's look at the spec sheet for this guy, 9050. So this has 90 degree horizontal, if you picture like a square going up from that, uh, and then 50 degree vertical, so I guess it would be like that. So it's going to spread sound more widely than it will vertically. Yeah, uh, on axis, off axis, the, the, the frequencies it's outputting are actually going to change depending on where you are in that cone. So if you're right in the center, that's on axis. Uh, you'll get more of the intended tonality of the speaker when you're on axis. But if you're a little bit off to the side, some of the frequencies are going to change on you. Uh, a spec sheet will also typically show you what that looks like. Let me see if I can find a download here. Here we go. This might have it. Uh, I guess it doesn't. I want to show you what it looks like. Speaker directivity chart. Oh, here we go. So there's an example. So it will give you the degrees. So you can see like in this zone, that's where you're going to get the more of, of the, the, the frequency response that you see on the, on the spec sheet, that's where you're going to get like the full blast of that. But then when you get out here to this blue zone, uh, you're going to start to lose 8 kilohertz and then out in here in this green zone you start to lose 4 kilohertz and then when you get out here to the, to the black, now you're starting to lose 500 hertz. Uh, so you lose more and more of the highs as you get farther and farther outside of the on axis zone right here. So just another dynamic to be aware of. Now we're going to get into line arrays and point source. So a point source speaker, that would be, well in, in theory, there's no such thing as a perfect point source, but in theory if you could picture like a point of space that all the sound is emanating from, that is a point source. Whereas the line array, as we saw, it has like lots of different speakers stacked on top of each other, so the sound is coming from all of that instead of just a point. 
Uh, some speakers have all of the drivers kind of inside of each other to get pretty close to an actual point source. Most speakers are more like this, where the drivers are spaced out, like you've got a high one up here and a low one like that. This would still, in a live sound scenario, be considered point source uh, compared to a line array. It's closer to a point source speaker than a line array would be. Um, if you get really up close to it, it's actually pretty cool. You can, you can actually hear the frequencies being separated out. Like you'll hear the singer coming out the top and you'll, you'll hear the bass guitar coming out the bottom. It's pretty cool. But then if you stand far enough away, it kind of resolves into one sound. Kind of like a theoretical point source, but it's not exactly a point source. Uh, let's see, I want to get, find my directivity physics here. So here, here's, here's what that means as far as coverage goes. Um, if a sound wave is larger than the source emitting the sound wave, it will tend to travel more omnidirectionally. So take my phone, for example. My phone, the speaker is that small. So pretty much every single sound wave coming out of it is going to be bigger than that. Maybe every sound wave, I mean, 20 hertz, I guess 20 hertz, I mean, 20,000 hertz, I guess, would be a, a little bit smaller. But pretty much every sound wave is a lot bigger than that tiny space. So almost every single sound wave you hear coming out of this is going to be omnidirectional. It's just going to be going all over the place. Uh, a larger point source speaker like this, it's going to be a little bit different. Like if the driver is that big, um, let's say it's like a six inch driver. Six inches is like two kilohertz. So everything below two kilohertz will be omnidirectional. Uh, everything above two kilohertz will be more directional. If the sound wave is smaller than the source emitting it, it will travel more directionally. So here's, here's the deal with line arrays. There's a, there's a few different things line arrays do. But be, because on a line array you have identical speakers that are stacked on top of each other, they kind of work together as one speaker, a speaker that's very tall but pretty slender. So it, it's disproportionate, which means that um, the sound waves coming out of it, uh, most of them are going to be smaller along that vertical dimension but bigger than the speaker along the horizontal dimension. So because they're bigger than the speaker horizontally, they're bigger than, than the array, they're going to scatter more widely horizontally. But because the line array is so tall, a lot of frequencies are going to be smaller vertically. And so they're not going to spread as widely on the vertical dimension. So you can use a line array to get very wide horizontal coverage, but more precisely aimed vertical coverage. Yes? That is one of the reasons. Okay. Another reason is because uh, corners tend to amplify low frequencies, and you're in a little box in there. So yeah, exactly. It, it, they're they're going to reach you more, and then once they're in there, they're going to bounce around those corners and, and resonate a lot in that room. Uh, low frequencies also tend to bend around objects easier. That's why if you have an object casting a shadow from the speaker, the low frequencies will still will still reach you because they're going to wrap around that object better than the high frequencies will. And just horizontally, they can get longer than the object. I, th I think it's something like that. You, you might know more than I do, but that's just how waves work. Ocean wa waves work the same way. Bigger ocean waves will wrap around objects better than smaller ocean waves. So that, that might be the reason. Um, yeah, so that's one of the, the advantages of a line array. Some of the, the other things that line arrays do is because you have different boxes that are, are identical. Uh, and here, let me show you a picture again of a line array so we have something to reference. I'm 
I'll show you like a really big, long one. Like uh, one of these guys. Ah! Where'd it go? Up here. Ah! Uh, right click and then image. View image. Maybe I should just do that? Ah! <laughs> Rawr. Open image and new tab. Thank you, Jordan. There we go. So because you have all these boxes connected to each other and they're connected in a way that they curve, you have different boxes aiming at different parts of the audience. So you can set those at different volumes. You can have a box aiming at the far back row of the audience and have that louder than the one that's aiming down closer to the audience and have that softer. So you, you can send different volumes to different parts of the audience and get a more even coverage that way. Uh, another thing they do is they use what's called phase coupling. Um, because the speakers are, again, identical and they're all right next to each other, when the sound waves come out, if they're in phase, those peaks are going to line up with each other and the troughs will line up with each other and they'll amplify each other phase coupling. So you get louder sound just because they're in proximity with each other, because they're so close. And I think, to answer your question, Alice, a while ago, I think that's actually why you only lose three decibels versus, rather, rather than with, with the inverse square law, typically with a point source, you lose six decibels. I think that's the reason. Because of that coupling. Exactly, additive. Could you have a line array so large and curved that they are eventually out of sync? Yeah. Yeah, and then you have to set delays within that line array. Wow. It's amazing how it's the biggest complex sound can be. Yeah. Line, arrays, like, yeah. line arrays can be really big. You, you can have like 20 boxes on each other. And they're usually daisy chained. So you have to take into account the impedance. Um, what, what else was, it, was I going to say? Because they're, they're daisy chained. There's something else I was going to say, I forget. But yeah, they're, they're daisy chained. Oh, I know. If something is wrong with, with one line, like if, say, the wires are crossed on one of your speak on cables and the polarity gets flipped, then the whole line array gets flipped. So, so one line array is out of polarity with the other, and, and you have to find out what's, what cable that is, which is why we need to carefully solder our XLRs and speak-ons in any cable correctly. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just making gestures. OK. Any other questions on any of that? Line arrays, point source, directivity physics? OK. Sound is water when it's inside of a wire, but it's light when it's coming out of a speaker. Frequency response. The human frequency range is from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. But we do not hear all frequencies equally. Uh, uh, we're, kinda, we're running low on time, so I'm not going to get too much into this, but there's something called the Fletcher-Munson curve. Uh, and it's been revised in more recent research into something called the equal loudness contour, the equal loudness curve. Maybe we'll get into that some other day, but you can Google that, Fletcher Munson equal loudness curves. That's basically just mapping the frequency response of the human ear. And quick takeaway, we're most sensitive to around one to four kilohertz. Uh, three and a half, I believe, is the resonant frequency of the, of the eardrum. Um, and we don't hear low frequencies as well. Um, and then I want to say it starts to trail off over 10K a lot. So, yeah. Uh, no speaker has a perfectly flat frequency response. Some, a lot of times you'll, when you're shopping for speakers or microphones, they'll say, this speaker is ruler flat, or this line array, I mean, this microphone is ruler flat. It's not really ruler flat. They might put a a chart on their frequency response chart where it looks ruler flat, but because of the way they printed it and stretched out the dimensions, it makes it look flatter than it actually is. There's no such thing as a perfectly flat frequency response. Let me show you a frequency response chart so you can see what I'm talking about. 
Here's an example. Wait, I'm going to, ah, open the image a new tab. So you've got the frequency range plotted there from 20 to 20,000. And one kilohertz is kind of the reference. So if you play, if you're playing the different frequencies out of the speaker with one kilohertz as a reference, uh, 10,000 is going to be 5 dB louder than what 1,000 will be if you're playing it at the, at the same volume, if that makes sense. And then 50 will be 10 dB less than 1,000 if you're playing it at the same volume. So the speaker, even if you're technically playing it at the same volume or same signal level into the speaker, it's not going to output all the frequencies evenly. It's going to output these ones higher than these ones. Um, every frequency, every speaker has a frequency response. It's not perfectly flat, no matter what the specs say. Um, yeah, and sometimes instead of showing you a chart, it'll just give you a range. Like it, it might, it might say, you can probably find it here. You'll see this like 50 to 20 at minus 10 B and then 62 to 19 thousand at plus or minus 3 dB, 3 dB. Basically, that's just an abbreviated way of, of giving you an idea of what the chart would look like if you had the chart in front of you. So on, w when you get down to 50, by that point, it's going to have dropped minus 10 dB below where 1,000 would be. That's what that means. Um, and then from this range, any deviations are not going to be more or less than 3 dB. That's what that means. In ruler flat, if you wanted to put a definition on it, that's ruler flat. If from this point to that point, the deviations are no more or less than 3 dB, that's ruler flat. Uh, some speakers, some microphones can actually get really flat. Like I think I saw one that was down to like 0.5 dB across a pretty large spectrum. Um, so they, they can get very flat, but it's never perfectly ruler flat, no matter what the advertisement says. Um, it it d d depends, depends what you're using it for. Could you say you're like setting up the room? Could you use like different speakers? Like you could, but you're not going to perfectly resolve it. Yeah, it's just, it's complicated with... Is that something that you typically would do, or no? No. I mean, to some extent, like subwoofers, to cover the lower end. But no, typically you wouldn't do that. You'd have your mains, you'd have subs maybe, you might EQ them a little bit differently at the system processor or at the soundboard. Um, but you just kind of have to accept the fact and live with it that you're not going to get a flat frequency response and mm -hmm. just do what you can to work with that. <clears throat> so speaking of that, when should you use subwoofers? Uh, I would recommend using it whenever there's significant frequency content below, say, 80 to 100 hertz. Uh, some examples, subwoofers, I would say, are not needed for spoken word. Most vocals, unless it's like a pentatonics group where the guy's going really low and they want that bass, most vocals are not going to need a subwoofer. Most acoustic live music, like if, if it's just a guitar and a keyboard and a vocal, you don't really need a subwoofer for that. Music playback, if it's just intended as light background music and people are going to be talking and enjoying their cocktails or whatever and the music is just sitting there in the background, you don't really need a subwoofer for that. I have two questions. Sure. Um, as far as acoustic goes, if it's like, like bass, Yeah. Subwoofers are recommended whenever there's a bass guitar, a kick drum, or an equivalent yeah, instrument. So, well, because we didn't get to that part yet. Yeah. My, my second question is um, in chapel, is the computer routed to subwoofers? Yes. Okay. Um, and then my question is so, yeah, whenever you have a bass guitar, kick drum, or some kind of equivalent instrument, like a cello, or, or maybe a, a synthesizer that's playing a bass line. A cajon, where you have like the bass, bass drum in there. I would use a subwoofer for that. When the music playback is not just light background music for people to chat over, when it's actually meant for people to listen to and, and hear that music, 
and you crank it up, I would use a subwoofer for that. Bass heavy genres like EDM or hip hop, I would use a subwoofer. Uh, rock or metal, you can get away without a subwoofer, even though there is a lot of bass. Most of it is not quite going as deep as in some of these genres where, that are heavily electronic. Because acoustic, acoustical instruments, even bass guitars, they just don't produce energy quite that low. Like if we're talking like below 50, below 40, I mean, they're down there. A piano can get almost down to 20 hertz, but you're not shaking the room <laughs> playing the lowest key. Um, most acoustical instruments are just not going to be that deep. But EDM and hip hop, you're going way down uh, into the 30s and, and possibly lower than that. So definitely use a subwoofer for that style of music. And we only have a few minutes, well, like 15 minutes. We're going to talk about microphones next. As you can see, this is where my slideshow ends because I didn't finish it. So it still says subwoofers, even though we're talking about microphones. Before we talk about microphones, any questions about speakers or amps or coverage or any of that? All good? Makes sense? Cool. Let's talk about microphones. I have notes on my phone for where the slideshow ended. Uh, let me see what I have in here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Microphones. So we've talked about dynamic microphones before. We've talked about them a lot in level one. It's like a miniature power plant. You've got magnet, coil of wire, you've got a diaphragm that moves typically the coil of wire in modern designs. I think there's some that use a moving magnet, but typically these days it's a moving coil design. I think I've, I've said magnet before just as an oversimplification to make it easier to understand the first time you hear it, but typically it is the coil that is moving. It's attached to the diaphragm and uh, it's like a mini miniature, power, miniature power plant. It's generating a voltage. That's a dynamic microphone. Uh, dynamic microphones have typically what's called a proximity effect, where if you get really up close in it, there's a, there's a drastic bass boost. So that's why when, when like a DJ gets up really close on their mic, their, their voice sounds unnaturally deep and can sometimes reduce the intelligibility. You can't really hear what they're saying very well, but it's just like a big booming voice because it's the proximity effect and when you back off, you get less of that. Condensers can do that too. Re really, it's, um, it's directional mics. Your cardioid, super cardioid, those will have a, a strong proximity effect. Uh, I want to say dynamics have that more than condensers, but it really has more to do with the directionality. This mic I'm using here, this is a super cardioid, so that's going to have more of a proximity effect. If I was using omnidirectional uh, lav, it would have less of a proximity effect, and so it wouldn't matter as much as I move my head around. It wouldn't the bass wouldn't boost if I look down at my notes or something. Uh, plosives. Plosives. I probably just created a plosive right there in the, in, on the recording. Uh, plosives are certain consonants, especially P's, maybe T's, where there's like an ex explosion of breath coming out of your mouth. Um, that just happens naturally as you talk, but with a microphone, especially if it has a strong proximity effect like this one, uh, it's going to make uh, like a popping sound. Boom. And if you have subwoofers or something, it's going to be a really big boom, like, like a gunshot every time you say pee. Um, you're going to get plosives. What do you do to minimize plosives? You can put on a windscreen, which I <laughs> forgot to do. Probably a lot of plosives in the recording. Uh, you could use an omnidirectional mic that can help minimize plosives. Uh, but even in recording studios, they have to use not just windscreens, but an actual pop filter that like, it's like this little grill mesh thing that sits in front of the mic. And some pop filters are better than others. So if you get, if you invest in a really high quality one, then it'll probably help. But even in studios, it's hard to eliminate plosives completely. So that's just, that's just a constant problem you have to deal with. So on paper, most windscreen manufacturers are going to tell you that it doesn't affect the frequency response. But they do. They do. Some, some affect it less than others if they're really high quality. Um, but yeah, they, they do have an effect, even though the manufacturers might tell you otherwise, because they want to sell it to you. 
Uh, handling noise, that's especially with handheld mics, you know, as you're moving them around, can, there's some like rumbling that you'll hear inside of the mic. You can also get that with the wire, if, especially on like a super cardioid mic like this. If my wire weren't run under my shirt and it was loose and bouncing around, it could create some handling noise, some rumbling getting into that mic. So good to be aware of that. Um, yeah, these notes are kind of out of order. I'm just, I'm telling you random things about microphones. I'm supposed to tell you how they work. But anyway, dynamic microphones, we already talked about that. Condensers, I don't know if you guys are fuzzy on how condensers work. We didn't really talk about it a whole lot in the level one training. You, you, you know, of course, that they need phantom power. Uh, it is a capacitor. So a capacitor is a device that can store charge and release it smoothly. So for example, well, the way it works, there's like two metal plates that don't touch. And there's like, I think there's like coil wires on each one, something like that. And um, you know, as electricity passes into the capacitor, the, the charge kind of gets stuck there and it builds up and it stores and then it gets released on the other end, out, out onto the other, other side of the circuit. So this is how um, on some devices, the, you turn them off and then when you turn them back on, the clock is still accurate. It's because there's a capacitor in there that's storing the charge and still feeding the clock after you've turned it off. So then as long as, as long as you turn it on before the capacitor drains, the clock will still be accurate. Um, a condenser mic, this might be a condenser, but a, a condenser mic has a capacitor, but one of the plates can move. So it's a, it's a movable plate and it moves with the movement of a diaphragm, just like in a dynamic. Uh, and as that moves, that affects how, how much voltage is stored and released from the capacitor. So that's how a condenser works. You know, the, the dynamic mic, the voltage varies according just to the movement, but with the, with the capacitor, it, it, it's, it's about the distance between those two plates. So th there's still movement, but it's doing something a little bit different, if that makes sense. Um, and that's why they need phantom power, because a capacitor needs electricity to get it going for it to do anything. The dynamic mic generates its own electricity, the condenser that there needs to be a current moving through those plates for it to function. So you need phantom power to power those plates and then it'll work. There's different kinds of condensers. For the sake of time, we won't dive into all of them, but I'll just list them off and you can look them up later and maybe we'll talk about them again later. But there's, there's tube condensers, there's back electric condensers, uh, FET condensers, um, yeah, there's different kinds. Uh, large diaphragm condensers, those have a large diaphragm. Uh, we have two large diaphragms on here, on our campus. There's our, our Neumann TLM 102. I, I don't know if you've all seen it before. We haven't really used it yet. Um, used it. You've used it. Uh, then there's, I can pull this one out from the camera. Probably mess up the shot. This is a small diaphragm condenser. Shotguns, pencil mics, these are small diaphragms. Um, and it, it just, it just affects like transient detail and stuff like that. I don't, I don't know how deep we have time to go into, but they, they do, large diaphragms are great if you wanna capture detail um, for like a wide area. Uh, they're great for like vocals also and stuff like that. Uh, small diaphragms, you know, those, those can be good for like guitars and stuff like that. I don't know. I don't want to keep saying stuff like that, but we are kind of running out of time. But uh, just be aware there's, there's different kinds, there's different sizes of diaphragms that can have different sonic properties. Uh, same thing with dynamic. There can be large diaphragm dynamics and small diaphragm. So the different diaphragms have different effects. Um, there's other technologies that we're not really going to deal with a whole lot here. There's ribbon microphones, crystal microphones, uh, guitar pickups. Um, it's debatable whether those are actually microphones. They, they kind of work like microphones, but the instrument itself is sort of the diaphragm. You know, as, as the strings vibrate, you know, they, they, uh, they change the properties of the magnetic field. Um, but the, the, the pickup itself doesn't have any moving parts. It, it relies on the vibrations of the instrument to 
change the magnetic field. So it's debatable whether that's really a microphone. Uh, some guitar pickups called piezo, I think that's how you pronounce it, piezo pickups, those actually are technically microphones. Those are crystal microphones. Uh, maybe I'll circle around back and explain crystal microphones in a second, but I just want to go through some other things. Uh, polar pattern again, you've got Omni, picks up evenly in all directions. You've got cardioid, which is like shaped like a heart. So it picks up from the side, mostly from the front, and it rejects the back. Uh, super cardioid is like cardioid, but it's stretched out, and so it actually does pick, out, pick up from the back more, and a lot more from the front and less from the sides. This is a super cardioid mic, so it's going to pick up a lot you know, this way. If I turn my head, when now I'm on the side, it's going to reject more of the side. It won't hear me as well. It's also going to pick up some from the bottom. So that's a good thing to be aware of when you're using a shotgun mic. It's going to pick up more from the back than a cardioid would. And then hypercardioid is even more elongated. Uh, directionality is one of the ways that directionality is achieved is through little slats like this. And this also has little holes on it. You can see there are little slats. And this omnidirectional notice doesn't have any holes or slats. So what that does uh, is, let me see how I can explain this. So some of the sound is going to come in directly you know, onto the top of the diaphragm. Some of it is going to come in to the back. Some of it is going to go in through the back, but then it's going to bounce off the top of the grill and back down onto the diaphragm on the top. And when that happens, uh, if they hit at the same time, one on the bottom, one on the top, they cancel, phase cancellation. And so that's how they're able to reject sound from the back. Or, well, this would reject sound more from the back. It's because they've carefully engineered those, those little holes in the, in, the, in the structure so that the, the sound coming in from the back, some of it hits the bottom, some of it bounces off and hits the top at the same, side, at the same time, canceling out, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, and then uh, frequency response. So, so when you're selecting a microphone, it's good to think about the polar pattern. It's good to think about the frequency response. Is it a, a dynamic? Is it a condenser? Uh, there's also a spec called sensitivity, you know, just like with the speakers where you have sensitivity. Microphones also have sensitivity that, that tell you, you know, how well it picks up. Um, yeah, there's different specs like that. Uh, we have like two minutes left. I just wanted to touch a little bit more on microphones in depth at, at a deeper level than we have before. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, I'm just going to stop there. Any questions on anything we've gone over, system design, speakers, amps? Microphones, any of that? One would be like well, hopefully, um, you guys will be able to take the lead on portable events in picking out speakers, looking at the venue, and then you know that then I, I don't have to do that as much. That that would, that would help take some of the work off of me for for, for some of that. So that's kind of the idea. These are also just helpful things to be aware of, um, even in our permanent venues. You know, just to be aware, you've got delay fills right there. So you've got like a dead zone from these speakers because there's a shadow being cast from that wall. So that will affect how you mix. Um, it's good to be aware of the inverse square law because way back there is going to be a lot softer than over here. And even though these speakers are high, they're not quite so high that you have like a really ideal range ratio. So you're going to encounter some of these dynamics in the permanent venues as well. And that's just good to be aware. I always, when I'm mixing from back there, because I know about the inverse square law, I'm, I'm always aware that it's, it sounds louder out here than back there, and that affects how loud I push things. So there's all sorts of situations, um, both with designing a system, which is what this is, system design, you know, designing a system for an event, or just working with the system you already have. You know, I, I use all this. I use all this knowledge like every week around here. So, and hopefully, you guys will be able to start using that more too. Make sense? Cool. So, our next system design course, we don't have it on the calendar yet, but we're going to go into gain staging. So, we, we've 
chosen our speakers, we've chosen our amps, we've learned a little bit about microphones, and, and then we're going to get into, well now we're going to set it up and we're going to start to optimize it with gain staging and system tuning. We'll, we'll, learn, we'll learn about that in the next system design courses. But that's all for now. Stop. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming. Cut the recording. Cut the recording while I dance. <laughs>